Good morning, and welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on the agenda this morning, the Federal Register Notice removing safety standard for magnet sets from the Code of Federal Regulations. Before we begin the hearing this morning, I just want to take a moment here to acknowledge, obviously, the change in seating. Uh, but I, and I want to first of all express my, really how proud I am and, and honored I am to be the acting chair here at the Consumer Product Safety Commission. But I also want to take this opportunity to publicly thank, as I have been doing since I took over, the service of Elliot Kay as our chairman. So I want to just take a moment here to recognize all of his service and what he has done for the Consumer Product Safety Commission, both as chair and his former capacities before that as chief of staff as well as um, executive director and, uh, and now as a commissioner. So if you would join me in just recognizing and thanking Elliot for his service. So this is uh, the maiden voyage here, and I have two experts on either side of me, so I expect everything to go swimmingly well. Um, it's clear from discussions with individual commissioners that there is an interest in a renewed attempt to promulgate a magnet standard that will pass muster in the courts. Therefore, I have asked staff this morning to be prepared to answer questions on this topic generally. For the discussion this morning, the CPSC staff members are Mr. Dwayne Ray, Deputy Executive Director of Safety Operations, Dr. George Borlais, Assistant Executive Director for Hazard Identification and Reduction, and Ms. Patricia Pollitzer from OGC's office. As a reminder too, I just want to remind my colleagues that OGC has sent out some rules of the road to all of us. I just want to confirm that everyone received them, and I'm sure Mary and OGC will not hesitate to keep us out of the ditches this morning as we proceed with our hearing. So this morning we're going to open it up uh, for questions and I will begin with my round of questions and then each of the commissioners will have five minutes as well. So good morning and thank you to staff for being here. Um, first of all, to begin with, I do want to clarify a point for the record and that is that I didn't vote for the magnet standard uh, that was vacated by the 10th uh, Circuit Court of Appeals. Although I was on the commission at the time, I was concerned about voting on the magnet standard while there were contested recalls involving the same magne magnets pending adjudication. Um, but because this action today is removing the rule from the Federal Register, I don't think it causes me and it does not cause me the same concern. It merely implements the court order for us to vacate the rule. So my first question actually is for OGC. Uh, does the Tenth Circuit court decision requiring us to vacate the magnet rule also require us now to promulgate another rule? Um, no, it doesn't require the commission to do that. So um, as you noted, the court, uh, the Tenth Circuit vacated the commission's rule, but it also remanded the, the rule to the commission. Um, so uh, the rule, the vacating the rule means it's no longer in effect, but remanding the rule means the commission has the option to um, address the, the issues that the court raised in its opinion and uh, issue, conduct a new rulemaking. Thank you, thank you. For um, Mr. Ray, for uh, Duane, can you explain to us how the original magnet rulemaking got started? Was it staff recommending the rulemaking or was it from the commissioners? Sure, I, um, I think I've shared with some. I still remember the day in, um, in one of the conference rooms where I, I felt like that there was a consensus to, uh, to move forward. Um, you know, it was definitely a staff-motivated uh, uh, push to, to get there. Um, but as with all of these things, we were definitely engaged um, with the chairman at the time, uh, Inez Tenenbaum's office, to uh, to get the full support to move forward on that. Uh, but yeah, I can I can still vividly remember that that day in that meeting uh, that that we made that decision to move ahead. 
Thank you. When that rulemaking began, was it part of an operating plan or was it independent of an operating plan? My memory, uh, it was in between those time uh, periods that uh, that this kind of came, and then eventually it did make it into the operating plan as okay. as uh, as it began to to take take place. Thank you. Um, if staff and I, and this is for Mr. Borla, Dr. Borlays, if the staff were act, uh, asked to consider whether or not to recommend rulemaking, can you talk to me and uh, for the, the commissioners what? Um, what factors would they consider? In proposing the rule, staff would consider all the factors that we do in every rulemaking. Um, there is some specific information, for example, should the commission direct us to repropose the rule that we could already rely on. A lot of the information from our engineering sciences, for example, on magnetic flux, flux index that hasn't changed in the last couple of years. The health science information on the you know health effect if a child swallows more than two magnets that hasn't changed in the last couple of years, but we would go through um, the same process we do with respect to the full epidemiological analysis of all the incident reports whether they've come in from NICE etc. Uh, as we've proposed the economic analysis, the regulatory analysis, the reg flex analysis, um, one unique aspect of this clearly is making sure we address the issues that were brought forth by the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals, but that uh, work has also been incorporated in the project plan. Thank you. Um, the, from what I can recognize from where we were then and where we are now, several factors have changed in terms of and then when we first initiated rulemaking on magnets. Probably the most significant to me is the exposure. Um, so even if the even if we determine the hazard is the hazard is the same, clearly since the ban was and the rule was put into place, the number of magnet sets has diminished greatly. So one could argue, even if the hazard still exists, the exposure to the hazard is was significantly um, diminished. So um, does the staff will the staff take that into consideration? as they're going through this analysis? The staff would look at that as they establish what their regulatory baseline uh, would be. Um, in the last package, we had a baseline of what was uh, before a lot of the compliance action uh, took into effect, and that is our starting position on it with respect to but that we would have to look at that. Thank you. My time is up, so I am going to um, move to have Mr. Uh, Commissioner Adler ask, ask his questions. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I welcome you as our acting chairman. I'm sure you're going to do a superb job, and I look forward to working with you. So I don't know whether this question is for Mr. Ray or Dr. Borlase, but let me ask it, and uh, whoever feels more inclined to answer it, please do. Uh, and this goes to the point of exposure that the uh, chair raised. If you recall, at the time of this decision, all but one of the 13 largest distributors of small, and not all of the distributors, just the 13 largest of these small high-powered magnet sets had ceased distributing the product. But since the court's decision, it's my understanding that one or more companies have announced an intention to remove, re resume sales of these magnets. Can either of you share any information generally about whether companies have announced an intention to resume sales of these magnets? Yeah, I can t I can take that. We um, in the Office of Compliance have done some initial surveillance both um, at uh, brick and mortar stores and also online. Uh, we are aware of at least three companies online uh, that are uh, currently selling what appear to be the similar magnet sets that were subject to the rule in the past. Um, we uh, some are on back order like uh, meaning they're, they're not going to be ready till uh, March um, uh, time frame and and later uh, but we are um, in the process of collecting samples and, and analyzing what is in the market from uh, from the online our uh, initial assessment of the retail we did not find them um, readily available in retail but I do think we are seeing um, the market begin to re-engage um, in this uh, in the sale of uh, of these magnet sets. 
And to your knowledge, have any of the companies that have announced an intention to market or that are currently marketing, have any of them modified these magnet sets in terms of the size or the strength of the magnets? Well, we are aware of a company when the rule was still in place that, that uh, basically made them smaller and less powerful to meet the flux uh, that was specified in the rule. Uh, so there were, there were company, there was at least one company to my knowledge that had compliant magnets, compliant to the, uh, to the rule. But, but there, you said there were three companies. Of the three companies, have you seen anything that would suggest they're planning on modifying the size or the design of the magnets uh, or the uh, strength of the magnets? Yeah, so uh, it, at least the one um, that we've actually got a sample of, uh, it appears to be a, a strong flux much greater than 50. So the Tenth Circuit, when they invalidated the rule, in part said they did so because, quote, the Commission offered no explanation or rationale for its apparent assumption that the observed reduction in injury rates would not endure. But if companies are planning on reentering the high-powered magnet market now that the standard's been invalidated, that would tend to be fairly strong evidence that the injury rates are likely to increase. Uh, is staff prepared to do an analysis of the likelihood of increased injuries and the likelihood of increased incidence of sales of magnet sets? Was that clear? You mean as if the commission directs us yes. um, to, to move ahead with, um, you know, I think our, our proposal um, that we were looking at and, and, and trying to provide some uh, resource estimates was, basically focused on um, the epidemiological side um, where the court had, had indicated it had concerns. Um, and so we would focus on getting an update on the injuries there uh, and then on the uh, economics memo where um, the baseline that was used for the, um, the, the benefit cost analysis. Yeah, and on the epidemiology, the court said that 90% uh, of the injury reports on which we relied and this was their favorite word, only possibly uh, involved the subject magnet sets. So the court said we hadn't provided a proper conclusion that the rule was reasonably necessary to eliminate or reduce the risk of injury. Uh, you don't have to go into detail, but can you tell me whether staff is prepared to explain in greater detail why the data on injuries is reliable and trustworthy? We are, and that's what we would plan if the commission directed uh, staff to take that on. Yeah, and I would also just commend to the staff's attention that the dissent in the case pointed to additional data sources, and I would hope that the commission staff would explain if we were to move to uh, continue this uh, rule to explain that in greater detail. Um, and the final issue that the uh, court addressed was the utility of the uh, magnet sets, whether that was outweighed by the benefits. Is staff also prepared to address uh, that concern of the court? Should we move forward? Yes, we are. Okay, and in final, oh, I'm out of time. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, uh, Acting Chair Burkle, and I also welcome you as I have privately and in a much more public forum than this, and I look forward to working with you. I also want to thank you and your staff for, um, on such quick notice, or relatively short notice, I should say, um, putting this hearing together. Um, I. I just want to say that um, in rereading the Tenth Circuit opinion within the last 36 hours, um, I can tell you that my view of the opinion, um, and, I'm, and I'm delighted at this, is that the court's ruling is very narrow and fact specific. Um, and it only requires us to address some specific technicalities of our cost-benefit analysis. And I don't mean to influence you because I know you'll do your own analysis. But I just wanted to make sure that in the analysis that you're going to do for purposes of uh, the next proposal to us, hopefully, um, will be to decide whether some aspects of the analysis need to be explained more fully, whether to analyze additional data, and whether to weigh any additional factors relating to the anticipated costs and benefits? Are those all questions that you anticipate addressing? Yes. Okay. I have nothing further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Chairman Burkle. Uh, thank you for your kind words that you have said here and, and another fora. Um, from the first time that I called you after your confirmation and called Commissioner Robinson after her confirmation, 
when I was Chairman Tenenbaum's Chief of Staff and offered my assistance to you in any way and then was in essence your staffer for the first couple of weeks that you got to the Commission, I think we've been able to develop a working relationship and a bond that is not typical of the city and we've done it in many different capacities now and I'm looking forward to continuing to do it in this capacity. Would the Commissioner yield for Absolutely. So the uh, when Elliot came into my office as executive director and it was myself and Nancy, I think it was just the two of us, maybe the first or second day, his first words of advice to me were, if you say the word phthalates, don't say pathalates. They'll know you're a rookie. <laughs> it's phthalates. <laughs> That's true, and I think that was a sense of goodwill that, that we didn't set you up. Uh, thank you, Ms. Pollitzer, Mr. Ray, Dr. Borles, for uh, appearing and for, of course, your excellent good work and assistance to us. Uh, Mr. Ray, if I can ask you, or Dr. Borlase, I'll leave it up to whoever feels it's more appropriate. If the Commission were to direct staff to prepare and send to the Commission as soon as possible a draft notice of proposed rulemaking to address the holding of the Tenth Circuit opinion that was issued in November of last year, what would the resource implications please be for that? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> based on the project plan and the staff we plan to assign, most of the implications would be two things. Uh, first, for this year, internal EXHR improvement projects that we were working on, and then um, separately some work in 17 that we were doing in preparation for 18 rulemakings, uh, specifically econ on portable generators. And do you have an estimate of the staff months associated with it? And it can just be an estimate. I'm not going to hold you to it. Sure. Um, from the project sheet, we estimated 11 staff months total across uh, EXHR and general counsel. Thank you for that. And do you anticipate when the commission uh, does a mid-year later this year that that would have any material changes to the mid-year? None beyond what I just described. Okay, thank you. No more questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Rohovic. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Commissioner Kay, welcome to the side of the, uh, of the dais. You know, unlike the Jeffersons, Louise and George, they moved up to the east side. You're actually, so you are moving east, but Chairman Berkeley, you moved west to a, to a loftier position. So take that as it will. But welcome to the neighborhood. Look forward to having you nearby. You've already made me lose my composure with a little joke once already, Commissioner Kay. Um, welcome, staff. And I do have some technical questions around uh, exposure. As I think the chairman brought up, uh, any sound risk assessment is going to be a consideration of hazard times exposure. And I agree with much has been said. Um, Dr. Borlase, as you pointed out, that, uh, that our staff doesn't feel like the hazard potential of small, high-powered, rare earth magnets uh, has changed. Uh, but I would do want to get to whether or not there is the exposure that then compels the commission to uh, allocate its very scarce resources towards addressing it in the most heavy-handed way that we can do so as an agency through regulation. Um, the first thing I want to know is uh, in terms of evidence of magnet importation, I think Commissioner Adler was talking about some of the um, uh, stated desires of different firms to get back into um, the, uh, the magnet sale. And, and I'm, when I mean magnets, I mean those that would be potentially subject to the rule. Is there any evidence um, that uh, these magnets are being imported? I think I recall, and I don't think it's been disputed, that uh, these products have, are all primarily imported and they're not um, mined or, uh, to be honest, I don't know how a magnet is created, but uh, I understood them all to be imports primarily from China. Do we have any evidence from our import staff through the identification of HTS codes that, they're, uh, that, they're, that their magnets are coming back into the United States? I don't have data in front of me, but we do have um, situations where um, direct-to-consumer sales are happening and occurring, uh, and those are primarily uh, imported. Have they, Mr. Ray, are they, are they coming in in any kind of numbers? I do, I, I respect the fact that you said you don't have any data, but do we have anything that, uh, that uh, causes uh, concern for the agency in terms of magnets coming in in any, in any particular high volume that would, uh, that would merit a priority for the agency to address? 
Yeah, again, again I, I don't have numbers. Um, you know, I think we've talked about what I think we view right now as a potential of that um, that reestablishing, and we are seeing that to that beginning. So I, I think that's uh, that's about as much as I can say at this point in time. Right, and um, of course, the having a seller and having a uh, a potential buyer uh, are only parts of the equation. There still needs to be a distribution channel. And um, I think I recall, can you confirm that uh, of the 2.7 million units of magnet sets that were identified in the previous package, over 95% of those were sold through traditional retail channels as opposed to direct-to-consumer distribution channels? I don't have that information for you right now, but I can get back to you on that. Do you recall at the time that magnets were coming into the market and however you want to categorize 2.7 million sets being sold, that's what we estimated. I think our recall numbers were a little bit different in terms of identifying some of the major players. Uh, but from what I recall from before I joined the agency is that one of the first activities of the, of the agency was to cut off the means of distribution and that is by working directly with retailers to advise them of the hazard, the concern that it posed uh, from the CPSC's perspective and to see if they would voluntarily stop selling the product and I believe that the agency was mostly successful in that effort. Um, do, you, do you recall the same in terms of how people were actually buying magnet sets? Yeah, I think you uh, correctly articulated the compliance actions that were um, taken at the beginning of this um, activity. And, um, you know, like a Commissioner Adler mentioned, we got the bulk of the, um, of the uh, companies that were selling to voluntarily agree to stop sale and, uh, and recall their products. Do you have any evidence of uh, the fact that retailers, by virtue of the rule being thrown out by the Tenth Circuit, uh, plan on changing their tune and now starting to uh, offer their retail channels as dis distribution channels to, to sell these products? Uh, beyond the online sites that we've seen, that's all I'm aware of. But you're point. not aware of any retail sites that are now changing their, uh, their business decision and now deciding to open up, um, as, uh, open up uh, magnets for sale to their, to their customers? That's correct. Okay. Um, and without getting, oh, I'm out of time. I beg your pardon. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, staff. Thank you. I think we'll have a second round of questions. If any of the commissioners have uh, any additional questions, I know I do. Um, Dr. Borles, I just want to go back to where we kind of left off so that if we argue that the exposure, or excuse me, that the risk of the hazard is the same, but the exposure seemingly would be less given the, the ban that's been in place for a few years now. Um, do you sense that, that that this issue or this risk demands immediate attention or is it something that we can put within the context of an ops plan and have s staff assess it within all of the other risks and hazards they're looking at? Um, we don't have a recommendation on like the timing uh, at this time, I mean I know it, it's come up today as part of it. So we put the work together as part of the timing and a lot of the discussion about exposure, et cetera, is exactly the work staff would do if directed by the commission. I know we've got a limited amount of information now to answer and the plan would be to do the additional work necessary to have that information to bring it to the commission as part of the proposed rule. Thank you. I want to talk a little bit uh, about com what Commissioner Adler brought up, and that was the court's language about the possibility. So when we're looking at the NICE data, has anything changed? Is there a more specific code now within NICE that would give us more certainty as to any harm or injury that's caused? What's going to change to make that possibly word be certain? When looking at it, um, I think staff would be much clearer in describing the work that was done and in analyzing all of the incidents and uh, better describing the confidence they have in their in their analysis. Uh, previously when they when it was described as possibly, I don't know that that fully captured the confidence that staff had that it was probably. Um, and so that is something staff 
if directed by the commission, would go back and, and uh, do as part of the reanalysis. Okay. And have, have there been any coding changes? I recall during um, one hearing we had specifically where it was raised that the coding is not precise for the NICE data. Has there been, have there been any changes when it comes to the NICE coding? Coding specifically, I'm not aware of a coding change. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the issue um, with retail retailers and so uh, we've done some like surveillance online surveillance as to whether they're coming in either um, via retailers you say that it was that done online or did you actually go into stores now the, the re retail surveillance we uh, physically visited 23 stores throughout the country um, primarily looking at like toy stores and things like that where uh, we had seen the product sold in the past and we did not uh, see the magnet sets for sale. And when they visited the retailers, was it, um, were there conversations about the possibility that they might come back into the market? Uh, I think that um, that's likely happened when our investigators uh, did that. I have not talked to all the investigators that went through that to, to be able to say with certainty how those conversations went, but I'm sure that's a possibility there. One of the uh, concerns and when we talk about uh, certainty and in this market research that we're sort of, do, we've done some obviously, uh, both the internet as well as in the brick and mortar stores. Um, do we, is there any certainty that this, that these magnets were a passing fad and now the consumer has moved on and despite the fact that they may be available again, the consumer has moved on to a different desk toy? Yeah, I, I don't know that we're going to be able to answer that question. Um, uh, you know, I, I think if the demand is the same as it was before, I mean, I think that's, you know, part of the, the concern if if we get back to that situation again. Uh, but you're right, things change. There's fads, um, products that are hot today and not, not tomorrow. So that's, a, that's also a possibility also. Will that be part of the consideration as we move forward, if we move forward with rulemaking? Uh, I'm not exactly sure how we, in consideration, in what context. Well, just to make sure that we're not chasing something that may not even be a problem where we're, this product may not be back in the market in full force like it was a few years back. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how we're going to capture that, um, but there may be some thought that we would have to put to that. I'm thinking more in our economics team. Um, they're pretty creative at trying to um, provide this kind of information. So I, I don't have an answer on it right now, but I think we could get back to you on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you very much. In continuing on the line of inquiry that uh, the chairman has raised, um, it's my recollection that these were introduced into the market in the year 2009, and within a very, very short time, the sales of them had exploded and jumped into the millions of sets. Am I correct in my recollection? <laughs> That's correct. And so uh, I'm also curious, uh, that was 2009, we're in the year of 2017. Has the actual uh, internet market grown, uh, stayed the same, or dropped over time in terms of just products generally sold? Do you think our economics team could give us some insight into that? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we could. I think, you know, um, I think it's it's clear to see from 2009 to now there's definitely a lot more sales online and general consumer products. Um, so I don't think that's a hard one to, I don't have the exact numbers, but I think that's definitely been a growing Yeah, trend. and I think that would be very helpful in terms of figuring out what the distribution uh, channel would be for the, uh, for the magnets. Um, and I would just, uh, this is not a question, this is just a brief comment, is that uh, it is true that we worry about exposure, but exposure uh, also is one aspect of our concern. The other, it's, it's always frequency times severity. Uh, and I see nothing in the indication of these products that the severity of the hazard has gone away at all. So that I think the court wasn't saying you need a certain minimal level of sales for us to make a proper finding. I think that what they were saying is uh, tell us what the 
uh, best quantification you can come up with with respect to your cost benefit analysis of the sales of these products. And one of the things that I think we're seeing is that it's a an incredibly moving target. Uh, and it's, you're, you're never going to be able, at, other than any, a snapshot at any point in time, to give that quantification. Uh, no further questions. Thank you. Commissioner Mo Robinson. Thank you. I very much respect the um, time frame that staff has come up with in terms of what's going to be needed for further analysis in light of the Tenth Circuit opinion. So I'm not going to ask you to engage in conjecture as to what you might find. Um, during that reanalysis. I think that the, as I've said, that the Tenth Circuit opinion um, in terms of the remand parameters is extremely limited and I think our hearing today is extremely limited. It's simply um, whether we're going to ask you to do an analysis and repropose and I'm going to presume that once the reproposal comes before us that we'll have the analysis that you're being asked to, con to guess about today and then we'll make the decision at that time. Um, so I have no further questions. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Kay. Thanks, Chairman Burkle. Uh, Ms. Powerster, just quickly, we've heard a few times that the rule was referred to as a ban. Is that accurate or is it a performance standard? Uh, really, it's, it's written as a performance standard. It sets out the requirements that must be met based on the ASTM toy standard, certain flux index for the magnets that they have to, uh, have to pass in order to be available, in order to meet the standard. Great. Thank you for that clarification. No further questions. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I want to further explore something that Commissioner Adler brought, brought up with regards to frequency in the hazard assessment and frequency of the incidents that have been reported to the agency. So I'll start with the Tenth Circuit's opinion, and um, I'm reading from page 13, and I just want to find out whether or not staff disagrees with any of the citations provided by, uh, by the court. But the court recognized that in 2012, there were 52 reported incidents uh, to the agency. In 2013, that number fell down to 13. And in 2014, that number was further reduced to two incidents reported to the agency. Uh, would you agree with, uh, with those numbers as provided by the 10th? They align with, uh, with your statistics? Page 13. I'm, I'm not ex exactly sure where they're referencing, but I'm sure it's probably, I cannot answer your question, sorry. Okay. Well, here's a question that you were able to answer for me prior to the hearing, and I want to uh, be able to provide that to the public as well. Well, the court said in 2012 the number was 52, and then it went down to 13, and in about halfway through 2014 it was 2, and then uh, you were kind enough to provide some additional data subsequent to the 2014 number, which showed an additional two incidents in 2014. So that would be four. And then you also provided that in 2015 there was one incident, and 2016 there was one incident. So for those keeping score at home, over a five-year period it went from 52 to 13 to four to one to one. Now, in terms of frequency, that would demonstrate that this is a very infrequent occurrence that we're seeing incidents related to these magnets. And I think that in terms of a look no further than item number one in our interpretive rule, which identifies the means with which the CPSC will prioritize its activities, severity, severity and frequency uh, are the first considerations. And we certainly have a lack of frequency uh, established uh, here. Uh, that's that's uh, just a comment that I'd like to make as, as opposed to a question. Sorry for putting you on the spot to confirm the court's uh, numbers, but I haven't seen those uh, argued um, subsequent to the issue of the, uh, of the court. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I have no other questions. Commissioner Adler, do you have any questions? I have none. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson? None. Commissioner Kay? No, nope, thank you. Commissioner Mohorovic? No, I do not. Thank you. Um, having, heard no, having heard no further questions, um, staff is excused from the table. And we're now going to consider any amendments or motions. Does anyone have any amendments or motions for the underlying matter? Madam Chairman, I have a motion. 
Mr. Kay, I will recognize you for your motion and I will ask you to describe it uh, up to three minutes and then after the conclusion of that, I will ask for a second. Thank you. Great, those words sound familiar, thank you. The text of my motion I'll read as follows. I move that the commission direct staff to prepare and send to the commission as soon as possible a draft notice of proposed rulemaking for commission consideration addressing the holding in the Tenth Circuit opinion issued on November 22nd, 2016 in Zen Magnets LLC VCPSC. And the motion has been distributed both prior to this meeting and is currently being distributed again. I'll give it a few minutes just to describe it. As my colleagues know, in addition to vacating the commission's magnet set safety standard, the Tenth Circuit panel explicitly remanded the rule back to the commission for, quote, further proceedings consistent with its opinion, end quote. As Commissioner Robinson has noted a few times, and I agree with strongly, this is a relatively, or I'll say this is a narrow ruling, or was a narrow ruling. The court simply determined that it did not have enough information to ascertain whether two of the commission's findings were supported. I firmly believe it is our duty as public safety officials entrusted with keeping children and consumers safe to follow the court's instruction and to address the remand without further delay. Doctors who treat children have recently publicly noted their concerns with the results from the Tenth Circuit decision. My motion calls for the commission to direct staff to prepare and send to the commission as soon as possible a draft NPR or notice of proposed rulemaking for commission consideration addressing the narrow holding in the Tenth Circuit opinion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Second. Having heard a second, we will now move to consideration of Commissioner Kay's motion. The commissioners will ask their questions and then we'll come back to you at the end. Commissioner Kay, um, unless any of the other commissioners want to yield their time to you. So I will begin the questioning. Um, in your motion, there's language addressing the holding of the Tenth Circuit opinion. Can you just explain what you mean by that? I think, again, as Commissioner Robinson has noted, it was a narrow holding and the staff is aware of the court decision and can use the court decisions uh, holding as guidance as to what the issues are that the court felt needed to be addressed. And so maybe can you de define how you're seeing the holding? What What is your Yes, yeah, so my opinion in this in my mind is irrelevant. I think the holding is what the holding is and staff will read the court opinion and send us, if we approve this, send up what staff believes is an appropriate um, response to that holding. Thank you. I have no further questions. Commissioner Adler? Um, yeah, I do have one question, and that is consistent with what the chairman was asking, and that is, does your motion contemplate any staff action or work beyond the work to address the concerns raised in the Tenth Circuit's decision? And as I look at the decision, there were three concerns they raised. One was the time frame. The court had sought an explanation as to why CPSC relied on this particular time frame for its uh, cost-benefit analysis, the quality of the data back to the concern about the word use of the word possibly, and the utility of the product. Those are three discrete issues. They're narrow issues. And again, I repeat my question. Uh, does your motion contemplate staff doing any work beyond addressing those types of issues? No. No further questions. Thank you. Commissioner Robbins. I want to thank um, Commissioner Kay for bringing this motion. I think this is precisely what we need to do next. And I also want to thank staff for so quickly putting together their estimate of the time that it would take to address the Tenth Circuit's uh, findings. And I, even though I fully appreciate that, like um, Commissioner Kay, my opinion is irrelevant here, needless, uh, but nevertheless, sometimes I feel the need to express it. Um, so I shall, that I completely disagree with the Tenth Circuit's findings. And rereading it, they, they started with a fundamental flaw in the basis from which they then went off on their findings. Um, but I disagree with their findings regarding the inadequacies of our carefully prepared um, cost-benefit analysis in support of the standard. And I believe the court willfully ignored the CPSC's explanations of the basis for the time frame of incidents to review and analyze. They ignored the wealth of data from NICE as well as from the physicians from NAFSPAGAN. 
on the number of incidents. They willfully ignored the methodology we used for analyzing the NICE data, and they willfully ignored our analysis of the value of high-powered magnets in its review of the estimated cost and safety standard. But as I said, uh, my opinion is irrelevant. The court vacated it, and this is now what we need to do. I felt strongly um, that my vote for this rule was correct when it was made. And um, apparently, unlike Commissioner Mohorovic, I have found absolutely no reason to question the, uh, the original vote in this matter, and we must address the court's holdings and repropose the rule to deal with this emerging issue. And I think that anything else would be an abdication of our duty. So I thank you for bringing this motion. Thank you, Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I think. Marty, Commissioner Robinson, we found an area that we completely agree with, as you said twice, how irrelevant your opinion is. I couldn't <laughs> agree more. Uh, thank you. And I'm not yielding any of my valuable time <laughs> to you for that. No I've, comment. I got a feeling you'll come around to it, uh, as irrelevant as it might be. Uh, Commissioner Kay, I've got a question in terms of uh, process and the orderly running of the agency. And what I think is is, is an inconsistency with the way that uh, while you were the chair, uh, you were addressing uh, items that identify the allocation of resources uh, beyond just the merits of what we have uh, before us right here. So when you were chairman, you insisted that uh, items and considerations before the agency that, uh, that identified the allocation of resources were to really only be considered during the normal uh, preparation of our operating plan, as well as the consideration of the mid-year, uh, of our uh, mid-year adjustment. And in doing so, we would be able to take full advantage of our technical staff's expertise and their consideration of whether something merits in terms of all the innumerable um, activities that we have before us. And this is different. Uh, your amendment is suggesting that the agency uh, direct staff to go into rulemaking as soon as possible, uh, as if almost this was uh, an imminent hazard before the agency when the facts of the lack of frequency of incidents uh, suggest otherwise. Uh, I would like to uh, yield 60 seconds of my time, if you would, to address um, why you think this is uh, this change in course um, different than the two and a half years that I've had the pleasure of, of working with you as chairman. Sure, and I don't think I need 60 seconds to answer it uh, in that, one, we've already heard from staff this will have no impact on the mid-year or the operating plan, no discernible impact, no impact that would require substantive changes to it, so I don't know why we wait. And more importantly, in the time you're correct, uh, every time that somebody had offered to change resource allocations materially, I felt it was more appropriate to do that. But we never faced a situation before where somebody was offering to change the operating plan in a way that would enhance safety or address a safety issue or even a court holding, which I think is a unique situation. So from my perspective, as long as it's in furtherance of safety and it's especially in this case responsive to a federal court ruling and staff has assured us that it will have no discernible impact on the operating plan, I'm comfortable with that. If you have other ideas that you feel like are in furtherance of safety and you want to work with me on that are outside the normal mid-year operating plan or budget cycles, I'm happy to work with you on those. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and, and thank you for your brevity as well. Um, I do think that um, uh, an alternative to the one that you've proposed is to direct staff to take this into consideration for our mid-year uh, adjustments, and then we would have the opportunity to see whether or not staff felt that it was uh, a proper allocation of resources, given all of the priorities that we have before us. Now, there was another element of your tenure as chairmanship, which uh, which I recognized and, and certainly uh, found it very hard to disagree with, is that quite often, uh, if not always, uh, there was a refusal to strongly consider a proposal, unless and you've spoken the first person as I think as opposed to the commission, unless you had a recommendation from staff, unless you had something that takes into consideration whether or not the staff feels, feels that this is meritorious. And in doing this in quick order without that, um, I would like to yield maybe the remainder of my time to you uh, for an understanding of why now it's different. I don't think the difference in terms of the chair you sit in really matters here. It's a matter of the orderly running of the agency, and you've always consistently said that 
and very often, not always, uh, agreed and went with the staff's opinion, direction, recommendation, not always, but most of the time. And yet, you're asking us to consider this, uh, which, would, uh, which would reorder uh, the priorities before the agency and reorder the staff's work without taking into consideration that and without us having um, an in-depth legal memo from our general counsel's office to let us know uh, our potential. Right, so with that, I'll yield. The staff's opinion is always going to be the most important factor for me whenever I consider anything, hands down. That's always been the case as long as I worked at the agency, and it always will continue to be the case, but it's not the only factor. Again, there is a court order here, and I think as Commissioner Adler has aptly said on many occasions, we exist for a reason, and Commissioner Robinson has said that too. We have to, we were presidentially appointed, Senate confirmed, put on the commission for a reason, and there have been times when you have come to me and asked me to support something that the staff does not support, and I have supported it or, and joined you in that, even if the staff has not agreed with that. It was a worthwhile use of reason. <laughs> I have a couple of additional questions um, for Commissioner Kay. Um, number one, Commissioner Adler mentioned um, he referred to the dissent and some additional sources of uh, data. And I'm wondering if in your motion you're considering part of the holding that information that was in the dissent. Again, uh, if you yield. Yes, uh, I, I, I'm going to leave it up to staff to interpret the holding of the case and to send us the staff's recommendation. Well, we're directing staff. Uh, I, I would guess, and maybe I would ask OGC, will there be a further analysis, a legal memorandum with the package that will come to the commission? Well, there's always a legal analysis with the package that comes to the commission. Additional from what we already, we've been hearing that a lot of it will not change. But given this fact, this dissent, will the dissent be factored into into this direction we're giving the commission, the staff? Uh, I just don't think that's a question I can answer here. Okay, all right. I'll, I'll. Uh, my second question to you is, uh, and again, this has to do with the holding. Uh, we're directing staff to address the holding in the Tenth Circuit opinion. Is, your, is it your intent that staff would be precluded from addressing any other issues? I, my my intent is that staff should follow the motion as written and address the holding. Thank you. I have no further questions. Commissioner Adler? Um, well, thank you for asking those questions, and as a point of clarification, my notion of the holding is what the court in its uh, totality decided, and you can't really understand uh, the holding until you also understand the dissent, and it seems to me that the issues raised by the dissent are issues properly addressable. Uh, and it seems to me that the staff uh, appropriately would look into that. But I th I'm glad you raised that question because at least I get to clarify my view of what the what the motion is. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Nothing further, Commissioner Mohorovic. Nothing further. Having fur heard no further questions, to Commissioner K, we'll move to consideration of the motion. Uh, Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? I vote aye. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Commissioner K. Aye. Commissioner Mohorovic? No. And I vote no. The yeas are three and the nays are two. The motion by Commissioner Kay has been approved. Are there any more amendments or motions to be considered here this morning? Having heard no further amendments or motions, we will now turn to the final rule on the Federal Register notice with uh, removing safety standards for magnet sets from the Code of Federal Regulations. We will have time for closing remarks, but that certainly doesn't, um, but does anyone else wish to be heard before we take the vote on the underlying question? <coughs> Commissioner Adler? Uh, no. Robinson, Commissioner Kay? No, thank you. Okay. And I have no further comments. Uh, having heard no further comments, we'll now turn to the final vote and I will call it. This is on the Federal Register Notice Removing Safety Standard for Magnet Sets from the Code of the Federal Regulations. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? Uh, I need a clarification. Does this uh, vote have to do with the amended uh, vote that we're taking? The words, vote I'm is, not clear what I'm no, voting on. The vote is just on uh, publication of the Federal Register notice providing notification to the public that we're removing the magnets rule from the CFR. That's what the vote is on the table. The motion was independent. 
Okay, uh, I vote aye. Commissioner Robinson? Aye. Commissioner Kay? And if I can just seek further clarification, the motion stands regardless of the vote that we are currently taking. Yes, it does. Okay. The motion was, there was, it, it was not an amendment to the package that was on the table. There was an independent motion as I understood it. Thank you, Ms. Boyle. I vote aye. Commissioner For further Robert. clarification, this is to cut red tape, to tear a rule out of the Code of Federal Regulations. Is that right? <laughs> no legal. I vote aye. No Thank legal. you, Chair. <laughs> The yeas are five and the nays are zero. The Federal Register notice removing the safety standard for magnet sets from the Code of Federal Regulations has been approved. We now turn to closing statements. We will have 10 minutes per commissioner for those uh, closing remarks and I will begin. To begin with, uh, I do believe it was appropriate for us to remove the magnet rule from the CFR and I appreciate staff's initiative in putting the package together for all of us. I am opposed to directing staff to prepare a new proposed standard at this time for several reasons. First, circumstances have changed since the standard for magnet sets was originally promulgated in 2014. In fact, a major reason for the Tenth Circuit Court's decision to vacate the magnet standard was the concern that circumstances have changed even before the original standard was promulgated. It seems to me that before we charge ahead, we should be asking the staff to pull together the updated information that would help inform the decision as to whether or not it even makes sense to once again propose a standard. Second, the decision to repropose a standard should not be made in a vacuum. Instead, it should be considered in light of the other projects and possibilities we have to consider. Rather than make a preemptory decision, we should be asking how the magnet risk now and in the future is likely to compare with the other risks we consider. Work on this issue will take people away from other projects. It seems to me that the appropriate way to address this issue and address those trade-offs and priorities would be made through the normal commission vehicle, which is the operating plan. Third, we currently have under consideration the appeal of the administrative law judge's decision rejecting the staff's request to order a recall of Zen magnets. I believe that moving ahead with new rulemaking at this time may now create more problems for the commissioners in that other matter. Finally, I believe this court's decision is an important reminder as to why it is very important and appropriate not only for us to be thoughtful but also to be data-driven in our rulemaking. As we look ahead, we know that the budget environment is likely to be challenging not only for us, but for all agencies. More now than ever, I believe that we need to utilize our resources more efficiently and effectively than ever. Thank you. Commissioner Adler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I uh, just wanted to make a quick comment about the Tenth Circuit decision um, and just to say that I have a great respect for our independent judiciary. I think it's one of the strengths of our system of government. So even though I disagree with some of the court's reasoning, I think we do need to pay careful attention to it and we need to respond to its concerns in a careful, well-documented and thorough manner. Uh, Commissioner Kay's motion does not ask the Commission to reinvent the wheel. Uh, to expend massive amounts of resources. In fact, it's a very modest amount of resources. It's less than one staff year, and we don't need to do that. The Tenth Circuit did not need any new information regarding the hazards of small, high-powered magnets, and I just want to read an excerpt from that uh, opinion. Uh, the strength of these magnets is part of their appeal. It can also pose a grave danger when magnets are misused. Specifically, if two or more magnets are ingested, a temptation to which children are especially at risk, they can cause serious damage to intestinal tissue that becomes tightly clamped between them. Attendant medical consequences can include hospitalization and surgery for such injury, injuries as perforations, infections, gastrointestinal bleeding, and tissue death. The danger is compounded when parents and medical personnel remain unaware of the type of magnets ingested and their heightened risks. This court very well recognized that this was an extremely serious hazard. What the court said was we need to give a greater explanation for how and why the commission reached its conclusions in accordance with what the law requires. Uh, we need to do that 
and we can do that. The hazards of this product have not disappeared, and if recent information is correct, the hazard is extremely likely to grow significantly as new firms enter the magnet market. Now, this is just a thought. I doubt that we can ever precisely quantify the risk because it's a moving target. And that's not just with respect to magnets. That's res with respect to most of the products we regulate. Uh, and therefore, I hope that any future reviewing court will take notice of that fact. We can give a snapshot, but this is a moving picture. And we need to be cognizant of that. But I do think that we can provide reasonable estimates of the costs and benefits of commission action in ways that will meet this court's requirements and the requirements of the Consumer Product Safety Act. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. I'd just like to preliminarily say that nothing that I've said today should be read as any disrespect for our judicial branch. The judicial branch has been my life, and I very, very much respect it. Um, in my world of litigation for most of my adult life, this um, would be the equivalent of trying a case for six months, coming to a decision, and then the appellate court sending back, uh, sending the case back for a few um, limited questions that need to be addressed before the judgment can become final. And to then just drop the case would seem um, something that's very counterproductive. And when we're dealing with a situation like um, the CPSC, where we have always been flexible in using our resources to respond to emerging issues. The Tenth Circuit has giving, uh, given us an emerging issue. And I um, would um, counter what uh, Acting Chair Burkle said in terms of impacting other projects because the staff has found very specifically and explicitly that it would not impact. Um, 2017 projects to address this very limited holding. We are not starting rulemaking all over again. Um, quite, quite, it's a quite different situation than if we were making um, that decision. So um, I, I also would just like to um, address this. I, I, I've done it before, but I feel the need to repeat it given um, Acting Chair Burkle's comments. We were given very, very different authority under Section 7 and 9 and under Section 15, and one doesn't have anything to do with the other, and I feel very comfortable in going forward with asking the staff to analyze um, the, the data that we have now, um, the, in, it, the, the data that we have in light of the Tenth Circuit opinion and um, come back to us with their recommendations and that having nothing to do with the litigation that's pending um, under Section 15. Um, <clears throat> I also um, would just, I, I feel the need to say that this notion that this Tenth Circuit opinion is a reminder to us to be data driven. I think that staff did an absolutely fantastic job in this rulemaking process in analyzing the data and as I've said, I very much disagree with the way the Tenth Circuit has, um, has omitted a lot of the data that we had before us when we made our decision. So I look forward to um, staff's analysis and under this uh, limited ruling from the Tenth Circuit and thank you so much for all the work you put into today. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Chairman Burkle. I'll note at the outset that I have been speaking today and will continue to speak today only with respect to the Commission's rulemaking efforts, and I'm not speaking in any way with respect to any other specific product matter or other proceeding. We are here today because the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals vacated our magnet set safety standards, and in my view, we are obligated to remove, or we are obligated to remove it from our rule book. While I voted for the rule, for this, for removal of this um, rule, we have to respect the court's, because we have to respect the court's opinion. I want to echo the comments that were made by my colleagues, Commissioners Adler and Robinson, about the importance of the independent judiciary. Uh, one of the benefits of my career is having served in all three branches and valuing the role that each of them plays and appreciating the court, the role of the courts, even though I vehemently disagreed with the opinion in this case. And I hope it doesn't end up being that you have only three members of one party defending the independent judiciary in silence from the other party, because I think that would be unfortunate. I think we should all agree of the value that, and the role of the courts that they play. This was a narrow ruling. The court simply determined that it did not have enough information to ascertain whether two of the commission's findings were supported. 
As I noted earlier, doctors who treat children have recently publicly noted their concerns with the results from the Tenth Circuit's decision. It is incumbent upon us as public safety officials to at least attempt to address the court's concerns without delays. I am very, very pleased that Commissioners Adler and Robinson supported my motion and that we were able to give staff the direction to move forward. Thank you to Commissioners Adler and Robinson and also, of course, to the staff for their continued safety efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Horovic. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, again, we hear the term being data driven, the priority, uh, the theme of this agency. I think it's one that uh, ought to be banned, like the word amazing in reality shows. Let's just clear it from the deck. Uh, because I think that it's too often one that's abused and it's manipulated. We use it when we think it's convenient. We like to say that we're data driven in this activity to allocate scarce resources to mandatory rulemaking after we had our rule thrown out when we see the numbers have gone over the last five years from 52 to 13 to 4 to 1 to 1. And yet, in the spirit of being data driven, we want to allocate scarce resources into mandatory rulemaking. Uh, I, I, I can't say that there is uh, in any sense of an understanding of what being data driven is would lead one to go back into rulemaking um, given the fact that we have, a, we have an opinion from the court that threw out and vacated our previous rule. There is a recognized lack of fidelity in the CPSC's ability to differentiate a magnet hazard as being one from a magnet set versus one that was the result of a liberated magnet, a liberated, high powerful, strong rare earth magnet from a toy. And we looked at those previous numbers that I've given of the incident patterns falling so dramatically, you'd have to ask yourself, well, why did it fall? Well, first of all, how about the fact that the CPSC recalled 20 million units of toys? for magnet hazards. This was a crisis. It was a crisis that was missed from any, everybody. It was missed from safety agencies, industry, et cetera. You know, if you look at 20 million recalled units versus the total number of magnet sets that were sold, there were only 2.7 million magnet sets that were sold. Furthermore, toys that were manufactured after August 17th of 2009 had to comply with virtually the same magnet performance standards that are incorporated in this rule. So that means that if somebody knows about when products are produced for sale and if it was based on a manufactured date, that means Christmas sales from 2009 included toys that didn't have to comply with the aspects of F963, which are now mandatory, which ensure that Magnets can't be released from toys and they have to be of a certain uh, reduced flux. And yes, also these numbers were reduced by the compliance actions that were taken against magnet set distributors. We currently have no evidence of strong rare earth magnets coming back into the market in a significant way. We have no evidence that the traditional retail distribution channels that provided the opportunity in the past for magnet sets to go from seller to buyer are coming back in the market in a meaningful way. They're not. And it's a matter of scarce resources. This is a zero-sum game at the agency and every operating plan and every mid-year we fight and claw for the most valuable uh, dedication of resources to look where the highest return on investment and I point out that while we can just go back into rulemaking in the absence of any evidence that these products are going to get back in the market and create exposure, we still have a child dying every two weeks from furniture tip over and 25,000 emergency room visits a year. Yet this commission refuses to put even one dollar into an award winning campaign to raise awareness of this lethal hidden home hazard. And that's what we're supposed to be. Uh, about making those determinations and making the smartest allocation of taxpayer dollars. We also have a commission rule that further identifies it. CFR uh, 1009.8 defines how we should prioritize our scarce resources. The first condition is frequency and severity. We've already proven that there is no frequency. And I quote from the regulation, two major criteria in determining priorities 
by the frequency and severity of injuries associated with consumer products. You know, our goal should not be just about writing red tape for the sense of writing red tape. I don't know what this fascination is. I mean, we should be about hazard mitigation through any means possible. A regulation, a rule, red tape, that's just one of the tools in our toolbox. Uh, I think that this has gotten so personal with this agency of having a rule being thrown up, thrown out, that we're ready to just hurl ourselves headlong back into rulemaking and to do it, quote, as soon as possible, end quote. It really, it really baffles me, other than the very personal nature of this issue as it's confronted the agency now for, for years and coming on maybe in a decade. Uh, we're doing this without taking the time to either learn the lessons about why we failed the first time or to figure out if there's still any need for the rule. Those are two questions I would want to have answered before I even voted to allow staff to go back into rulemaking, much, le much, much less demand it. Uh, I think this is a factor of pure ego. And this agency has taken the thoughtful opinions of the Tenth Circuit personally, and we just want to win for winning's sake. Uh, anybody who has heard me speak uh, lately or was in the conference last, last week at ICFSO, they've heard me talk about regulatory humility. And it's a virtue that is very scarce. It's lacking here and it's lacking across the administrative state. And no one is more humbled than I am by the thoughtful criticism of two federal appellate judges, two exceedingly intelligent and well-credentialed legal scholars. It's an exercise in pure regulatory hubris to ignore that criticism and stitch together the tattered scraps of this rule and run it back up the flagpole. I would rather want to learn from this epic failure and not repeat it at a cost of taxpayers footing the bill and more worthy activities around demonstrable safety risks that consumers actually face today. Uh, I wish we were not going to make the same mistake twice when there are so many new mistakes we could be making. That's what the motion does today. That's what the activity and the actions of this commission does today. And that's why I'm not in support of it. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Uh, once again, thank you to my fellow commissioners and to staff for being here this morning. This concludes this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission.